It's my great pleasure to welcome you all for our session, New Applications for Existing Technologies to Improve Maternal Health. My name's Jeff DeBocco. I have the good fortune of uh, coordinating our Global Health Initiative and directing the Environmental Change and Security Program. I want to thank you all for braving the tornado alert and the flood alert and such to join us on this soggy day in Washington, D.C. Um, for what is the eighth in the series of um, maternal health meetings that we've had here at the center. We are uh, very fortunate and very pleased to be collaborating with and have the support of the Maternal Health Task Force and UNFPA, as well as uh, technical advice and support from USAID to make this series possible to provide this forum uh, for dialogue between the worlds of research and policy and practitioners, and then within those communities as well, uh, we have uh, precious few opportunities to do that. And so uh, we all, the collective team that's, that's working on this, are so pleased that we've been able to do that uh, here at the center and have uh, a rich set of discussions, and as I said now, uh, up, to, up to number eight. The Wilson Center itself, uh, as I think some of you know, but I'll, I'll mention it, is the formal memorial to Wilson. <coughs> he was our only president to have a PhD, so Congress, when they set us up in 1968, saw fit to um, have a living memorial where the worlds of scholarship and policy could come together. Um, and so uh, since 1968, on a nonpartisan, non-advocacy basis, the Wilson Center has been doing that. Our Global Health Initiative is a, a considerably younger program, uh, but one that we like to think punches above its weight in terms of uh, providing this forum for discussion on key health issues, although, frankly, we've really focused and spent uh, the majority of our time on these maternal health issues, and so we're very pleased to have uh, today's session as well. I also want to mention that we are webcasting this live, and then the archive video from all our meetings are online. A particular welcome to a class that's joined us for the first time in this series, the University of Virginia Master's class, Health Behavior and Health Promotion, are tuning in as a class today. So we welcome them and encourage them to uh, share their insights and reactions with us as well, and we'll be sure to get that on to the, to the speakers. So I'm going to turn it over now to Tim Thomas from the Maternal Health Task Force, who's going to uh, help us navigate the day and introduce our, our panel of speakers. Uh, but again, thank you for braving the weather, com weather, coming out and joining us, and Tim, we'll throw it to you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everybody, for, sh for coming today. I think this is an, uh, one of our more exciting um, uh, sessions in this, in, this very, in this very new dialogue series that we've been convening around maternal health in the past year. This is, uh, as I think you all are aware of, this, is a, um, this area of mHealth is um, challenging uh, the maternal health world in many ways, mostly for the good, I think, and we're excited to probe it more today with these three experts. I can't help but notice that here we are at a maternal health policy dialogue series and we've got four men on the panel. Now, uh, however you may see that, I actually think that's a good thing since being at the maternal health task force and working on some other maternal health initiatives, I have usually been the only man in the room and I'm kind of tired of it. So welcome, gentlemen. I'm glad to be part of your panel as well. <laughs> Uh, the first thing I wanted to do is just sort of frame what we're, what we're doing today. In, in our recent conference that the Maternal Health Task Force convened in Delhi, one of, the, uh, one of the emerging priorities that came out of that conference was uh, data collection. Uh, we've all been talking about maternal mortality estimates, but we're not talking about maternal mortality actuals. And the, oh, hello. Oh, I, will, I can quiet down now. Um, and I think the, the, the experts are, are frustrated by the fact that uh, the vital statistics registrations in so many uh, developing countries is uh, lacking, that health management information systems uh, are lacking, that even though new technologies may exist, they have not been integrated into the daily work of the people who do the work. And uh, the part of, this, uh, part of our, our interest in this series, and this, certainly in this issue, uh, this uh, uh, dialogue today in this series, is to explore how new uh, information technologies can help the maternal health field advance this, uh, this very crucial need to accelerate and improve data collection, and, uh, and also how, that, how the feedback systems work. So although I don't want to, I don't want to preface what these guys are going to say because I think everybody's they've, they've got all exciting takes on the M Health world. That's one of our overarching um, perspectives that we are seeking to learn more about at the Maternal Health Task Force. 
And I know my colleagues at UNFPA who will join us later today share that as well. So let's start with uh, this exciting new uh, initiative called M Health. David Aylward is the first executive director of the M Health Alliance. I won't read his uh, bio in great detail because it's too long and too impressive and consequently too intimidating. So da David, I'm going to turn it right over to you and ask you to take the presentation along and uh, let's begin this dialogue. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you for coming and thank you for having me. Um, I am, as he said, working at the uh, host of the United Nations Foundation with a new organization called the uh, M Health Alliance. And so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the M Health Alliance is, talk a little bit about M Health, and then talk about um, what our focus on the maternal continuum of care. Um, the M Health Alliance came about uh, a couple of years ago when Rockefeller Foundation convened a session to talk about this emerging area of, of wireless. Um, and they decided, um, and I'm glad they did because I have a neat job, uh, that what we needed to have was an organization to pull together the different domains that impact on M Health. And we, we did a little mapping here of public to private on one axis and mobile to health on the other axis. And what we find is that we are continually matchmaking. We're continually bringing people together, and our mission has been to define how to do this in a useful way. Um, we have uh, our founding partners are the Vodafone Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, PEPFAR, uh, the Global Wireless Association, GSMA, and as I said, we're hosted to the UN Foundation, and we're expanding the, the group on the right, hopefully to include your organizations as we move forward. Um, we exist because of this. Um, uh, I was looking at some country-by-country country numbers five years ago in, in Tanzania. There were about two million people who had uh, cell phones. Um, and most of them hopefully are competent at technology more so than me. Um, And five years ago, they had two million cell phones. Uh, today, or actually at the end of 2009, there were 17 million cell phones. Um, what's happened is we've had an explosion, and it is in the um, developing world. Mostly 70% of the cell phones are developing world. 85 to 90% of the world is covered by a signal. So yes, there are places that don't have cell phones. There, it's there, there are people who don't have them, and yes, there are towns that aren't covered by them, but that's changing fast, and the quality of the signal is changing fast. We know the trajectory of this. Uh, we know where it's going. Uh, and so the neat thing for us as we talk about healthcare is we really don't have to worry that much about the underlying transport uh, and the capabilities of the handsets. Those are, those are increasing and, and, uh, and what we discovered is that there is a private sector market. This didn't happen because the World Bank got together and said, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we had this? This happened because people who are very poor have voted with their limited funds uh, to have access to information. So as we look at this and say, well, gee, that's neat. What could we do for that? Uh, if we were in agriculture, we would be saying, how can we advance agriculture? If we're in education, we'd be having this conversation about education. We're not. We're in health. So we'd say, well, what can we do about this? And the first thing is, is probably the most powerful thing, and that is that women, people generally, but women in particular, have access to information. I mean, that they didn't have before. They're not reliant on their mother uh, or their uh, neighbors or the shaman or, you know, whoever it is. They can actually access information, and we can access them. Um, people can communicate. And it's not just verticals. They can access horizontally. One of the most powerful things here that has yet to really be explored is the use of social networks and the importance of social networks, whether it is women to women or a community health worker to community health worker, the kinds of isolation that have dominated this field. Uh, probably the most important thing happening here is knocking down those walls. Uh, the second one uh, is treatment and primary care. Um, uh, I, I agree that, that this is really powerful in terms of data collection and feedback, um, but I think one of the problems in this field is it's been dominated by the data collection people up to this point. Um, and, and I think strategically if we focus on treatment and primary care, we're one, going to save a lot of lives, and two, in the, as a byproduct, we're going to create a hell of a lot of data that the data people can then mine. And that's actually a really important point that we can talk about later. 
Uh, there's training and management of health workers. One of the givens in this field is a lot of the people who are supposed to be showing up for work are not showing up for work, and their managers don't know it. In India, the, the statistic is something like 40% of the time, government-paid doctors are not on the job. Um, training, real-time training, back-and-forth training, remote training. Um, probably the most exciting area in terms of the transformation of healthcare is remote diagnostics and per, uh, patient monitoring. And when I took the job 14 months ago, I thought that was interesting, but several years away. I think it's more like a year or two away. Uh, it's very close in terms of what can be done. Once we establish all of that, we're in a position to do disease and academic tracking. Epidemic tracking, again, is a byproduct of having a decent primary care system. And then there are a lot of subsidiary uh, uh, systems uh, that can be implemented using the same tool set. Um, at the uh, um, summit we're going to have 10 days from now, we have several sessions on the intersection of finance, and M finance, and M health. Um, and then, not to be overlooked at all, uh, are supply chains and system administration. I mean, the, the, the things underlying the plumbing that makes this system go. And um, uh, with a bow to my colleagues from Johns Hopkins, I was going to put research and have its own bullet, Alan, but it wouldn't fit on the page, so I apologize. I, I don't want to downgrade what you do. Um, the thing to realize on M Health is that uh, there's a value stack. And we're down at the bottom. Right now, most of what's happening on mHealth around the, country, around the world is uh, uh, communication systems, health and wellness. We're sending messages to people saying, do this, don't do that. Uh, you're pregnant, take folic acid. Uh, don't smoke. Uh, wear a condom. Uh, come to your appointment. Uh, th those kinds of things. And it's useful to be thinking about a path forward that will lead us up to a transactional system uh, whether it is um, uh, an interview that, that brings in data and that data connects with data that's already in a record and that connects to an intelligent system that's, that's through decision support says this is what we should do, or um, that, that really moves into an expert system. Uh, but, but that's the pathway that we're on and we should recognize uh, that we're very much at the beginning of all of this. Um, we face a number of challenges. I mean, uh, I'm extraordinarily excited about the opportunities here, but we should recognize that, that this is not, we can't assume this is all going to happen. Um, in fact, uh, there's, a, there's a remarkable lack of high-level government understanding about ICT in general, um, or uh, uh, mobile in particular. We have a global health initiative. Uh, this government announced a major global health initiative to much fanfare. Um, the president went to the UN to announce it and talk about it. Um, and if you read through all the papers, and I have every single one of them, the supporting papers, the initials ICT never appear anywhere. There is no discussion whatsoever in the United States government's global health initiative of the use of information technologies, much less mobile. And that absence of understanding is replicated throughout the world for the most part. Um, below that, there's a lack of real understanding of where the value chains are. There's a focus on individual values, but not of a full chain. And, and when I say chain, I'm thinking in this case specifically along the maternal continuum of care. What is the value chain there? And understanding that, what is the economic business model? Uh, whether you're the Minister of Finance in a country being asked to invest in this field uh, or a wireless carrier wants to make money on it, wh what are the business issues? And we, we've only begun to scratch at that. Um, we have a lot of individual uh, interventions, pilots and so on out there, but we have few to no integrated interoperable systems. Um, the tragedy of the commons, uh, I just ran into old, old dear friend of mine, uh, Kent Hughes, who works here, who's an economist, and he knows all about the tragedy of the commons. It's a, it's a term economists use uh, to talk about the old village commons, the thing that everybody shares, and because everybody shares it, it gets overgrazed. Uh, uh, people don't care for the things that, that are shared. And in this space, there are a lot of people focused on this application or that trial, but very few people focused on the things that we need to share to make all of these systems work, like standards. Um, and 
having tried to do this stuff in the developed world, I can tell you, in this country, I can tell you, it's absolutely fundamentally impossible to do the kinds of transformational things that mobile allows you to do in this country or in the developed world. So here we are looking at the developing world with, with this wonderful green fields in the sense that there's very little technology there, there are very little uh, barriers uh, of legacy systems to get in the way or more importantly groups surrounding the legacy systems to oppose change. Um, and, and yet you have this wireless platform that's there. So there's a real opportunity to get this right. Um, but unless we really intervene in this and really work together, the, the danger is that we will replicate the Western model of, of ICT everywhere in healthcare uh, in an extraordinarily inefficient, non-interoperable, non-functional way. So we're doing a variety of things. One of them is our maternal uh, M Health initiative, which uh, the Partnership for Maternal and Newborn Care, PATH, BRAC, um, Family uh, Health International and a variety of other groups have helped us put together. We invite participation in it. <clears throat> Number one, we're focused on communications, uh, finding out what people are doing around the world, getting people to let us know uh, what they're doing, register their projects, uh, uh, register devices, register systems. One of the things we found is most people have no clue what other people are doing uh, in this field around the world. Second, bringing together the M&H experts with uh, the ICT experts uh, talk about what do you need done. Um, third, mapping ideal solutions, figuring out what, what is, where can ICT really support the continuum of care. Co-building the prototypes of those systems with people, putting them in the field, and then communicating about them and just continuing to do that. So that's what the initiative is about. It is designed to work along the continuum of care, both at the, the top line being the woman, the bottom line being the administrative systems, uh, and in between some examples of the types of systems that, that we're we'll, we'll working there. Um, so we would be delighted for you to get involved. Um, delighted, uh, this is not something that we have the answers to. Our mission is to convene, uh, to convene with a point of view, which is that we think ICT, particularly mobile, can help a lot in this field. Um, we'd love for you to register for our newsletter. We would, uh, in particular, like you to go on Hub, which is Health Unbound. It is a global information sharing capability that with PEPFAR's support and Rockefeller's support and others that we're just rolling out, uh, where you can register your project, you can create a workspace, um, you, you can share ideas with other people. Um, I would be, my staff would kill me if I didn't mention that we have the M Health Summit on the 8th to 10th of November at the DC Convention Center. Students get cheap rates, um, uh, government people get cheap rates, uh, others, it's uh, from the private sector, it's still a good investment. It's uh, mhealthsummit.org. Uh, Bill Gates is going to talk, Ted Turner is going to talk. It's really turning into a neat event. And on Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock at the convention center from 3 to 5.30 or so, um, whether you come to the, to the uh, summit or not, we're going to have a working session of our maternal M Health initiative, which you'll be invited to. Um, and uh, that's really what I had to say. Uh, I think just in summary, this is a very exciting time. Uh, the fact that 4 million kids die before they're 30 days old usually out of ignorance or out of things that we could prevent or that uh, or that we have no clue how many women are dying. I mean, it's just ridiculous that people argue, well, it's 350,000, no, it's 500,000. Well, do you have better data than me? No, I have different estimates than you. you know? um, it, we should end this stuff. Uh, and in doing so, the, the exciting thing about it, if we believe that if you establish a really strong maternal M health, e health system that that can be turned to any form of primary care uh, very, very easily. So it's it's a way of both empowering women, which is the best thing we can do for these communities uh, broadly, but also uh, building strong health systems. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, David. That was that was really encouraging. I think uh, another thing, another. Uh, uh, interesting facet of the, our, our Delhi conference that was specifically on maternal health is that when we were uh, sorting the abstracts, there were some people who were talking about ICT and they wanted to be in the communications and advocacy stream. 
And then there were some that were bound to determine that they wanted to be in the health system strengthening stream. And uh, I, found, I find this an interesting uh, tension that is it a communications application or is it something larger that is actually going to uh, do the uh, sort of the, catch the holy grail of, of helping us strengthen health systems for the betterment of uh, women and children. Josh Nesbitt is up next. He's the executive director of Frontline SMS Medic. Uh, Josh also has an impressive bio, which I won't uh, I won't bother with it's in your it's in your packs. He was um, uh, we we he came to our attention when we were convening a, a youth summit at the Women Deliver Conference in Josh, and his uh, what came to uh, talk to the young people about new applications of information technology. And I know that his sessions were among the most popular. So take it away, Josh. Thanks. It's great to be here. Um, I see a lot of friendly faces in the crowd, uh, but also lots of new faces. So this is exciting. Um, I want to talk about why Frontline SMS Medic does what we do, and also talk a little bit about specific tools uh, and programs that might be um, most interesting to you all. So I spent uh, part of the summer of 2007 at, at one hospital in Malawi, and this particular clinic was serving about a quarter million people, spread 100 miles in every direction. Um, Patient-physician ratio in Malawi is one doctor to 100,000 people, uh, this particular hospital had two doctors serving a quarter million. Um, and like a lot of NGOs, a lot of clinics, they had turned to a network of volunteer community health workers, subsistence farmers, retired school teachers, basically people who've stood up and said, I want uh, a basic drug kit, I want a little bit of training, and wa I want to help decentralize care. I was told there were 500 of those CHWs, uh, and I was at the clinic for eight weeks and only met one of them. Uh, and Dixon, in the middle of this, the screen here, was walking... 35, 40 miles every six, seven days to hand deliver patient reports uh, for about 25 HIV positive patients he was tracking. So it was clear that these health workers were just as dis disconnected as the patients were from the clinic. Uh, but it was also clear that there were tools that could help. Uh, I was studying international health and bioethics at Stanford at the time um, and met a guy who was living out of a van on the edge of campus creating this free and open source software called Frontline SMS. What Frontline does is basically run on a laptop or a desktop, and you plug in uh, a GSM modem, uh, basically a USB dongle, and a local SIM card, uh, or you tether a mobile phone by data cable. And that creates uh, a local SMS hub. Um, and the base functionality was just being able to coordinate large amounts of contacts and coordinate large amounts of incoming and outgoing text messages. And that's really what we needed, and it was the, the right fit for rural health care. Um, so we trained 100 community health workers to text message. Um, this was uh, late 2007. Gave them solar panels, uh, individual panels to, to keep the network off the grid, um, and really saw what use cases grew organically. Um, these were these were early days, and so um, we we were really excited by the results. After about six months, um, for the first time, uh, this network had enabled emergency care, uh, and over about six months, 100, 150 patients who wouldn't have been seen otherwise received care. Uh, we also saw the home-based care tuberculosis and HIV teams shift their routine patient follow-up uh, to SMS, and over about six months saved 2,100 hours of travel and work time uh, and a couple thousand dollars in motorbike fuel. And the ongoing cost for this program over six months was just $500 for the SMS credit. Anytime you open up a channel like this, it's going to be used um, sort of organically and uh, one of their, their favorite use cases was sim just simple management and coordination with their, with their health workers. And this was perhaps the most exciting use case from this particular pilot um, through an active SMS-based case finding system that actually doubled the number of patients they were treating for TB over six months, jumping from 100 to 200 um, at this clinic. We're now looking at um, sort of the different entry points for these tools and systems. Uh, and one very clearly is uh, referrals. So this is a di diagram we, we drew up after uh, thinking about a system in uh, South Africa where patients are diagnosed at a hospital for tuberculosis and they're referred to their local, uh, local clinic for care. And that local clinic is about 20 miles away. And they're losing 75% of patients between point A and point B after they're given three days worth of drugs. Um, so it just so happens there are about 100 community health workers surrounding each of those local clinics, eager to help coordinate care, um, but just didn't know who was being diagnosed when, who needed to be where. Um, so we think that SMS overlead uh, can make a big difference there. Another really intuitive use case I think and relevant to this crowd is, is stock level monitoring, um, both from community-based clinics as well as 
uh, facilities where there is this uh, really um, terrible time lag uh, that we're seeing. So it's been a really busy year and a half. Uh, we co-founded Frontline SMS Medic in early 2009, and now work in 11 countries uh, with uh, 20 different partners across 20 sites. Uh, and we're basically looking to see how we can scale and replicate both vertically and horizontally models that we've shown can work, but also build new tools. So before I talk about technologies, I wanted to, to mention um, a project in Haiti. Um, and I think I was supposed to talk about partnerships as well um, for this, this session. Um, we worked with uh, 15 different partners, nonprofit tech startups, for-profit tech startups, mobile operators, US government, um, anyway, lots of different people uh, to create basically a makeshift 911 system uh, after the earthquake in Haiti. Um, so this system allowed anybody on the ground to text to a short code, to text to 4636. Uh, we then pulled those messages to a website where we had about 1,500 people all around the world, um, the Haitian diaspora, who were translating, categorizing, and geotagging these messages. And that produced structured reports uh, that we gave to a group of about 200 crisis mappers based out of Boston um, who were refining the coordinates uh, and passing on actionable reports to first responders and relief organizations. And we processed about 80,000 messages in the first three weeks after the earthquake. Um, and anyway, if you're interested in some of the, the stories and what, what developed from that, uh, I'd be happy to talk about it. So to return a bit, um, one of the pieces of technology that we use is called Frontline Forms. And this is basically uh, a J2ME client that will run on a 30 to, 30 to $45 handset. Um, so this basically lets you create a structured form at that local hub, then export that form by either SMS or data cable uh, to these, these low-end handsets running in the field. Um, so a health worker can click through an, a graphical user interface and then upload that data by compressed SMS. We're also working on different platforms. Um, so in the last four months, we built the messaging module uh, to do Twitter, email, and SMS uh, for OpenMRS, which is an open source enterprise level uh, electronic medical record system. But we also realized that there was space um, and that a lot of our clinics were uh, stepping into the electronic health space for the first time by using these mobile tools. Um, so we created Patient View, which is essentially a lightweight EMR that sits within Frontline SMS. So what this does is organize all of the forms, all of the SMS, and all of the structured SMS in a way that makes sense for a clinician. So it builds profiles uh, over time for patients and for community health workers. We also realized that um, we needed to be creative about structured information uh, that we could collect th through ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous technology. And so we created text forms, uh, and we're just rolling this out uh, in Pakistan. And this basically lets you uh, initiate a Q&A session by SMS. Um, so you can ask for uh, multiple choice, uh, lead a user through a checklist, ask, ask them for a number, um, and this is keyword based. Um, so if they for example, uh, want to update a dynamic resource map. Uh, this is a product that we uh, worked on with Google um, and are piloting right now. Um, you basically see a web, a web app here called Resource Finder. Um, and each of these points here, uh, available hospital beds, whether or not uh, that particular clinic is reachable by road or has sustained damage, each of these pieces can be updated in real time by contact uh, at a clinic um, and by SMS. We're also looking at ways that we can basically be smart and enable local action uh, when you're off when you're offline, um, and enable mapping when you're offline as well. So we work with USHID, which is a crisis mapping group, uh, to essentially use OpenStreetMaps and Google Maps uh, to create uh, offline mapping. So you can basically plot the locations and the catchment areas of your health workers or your facilities, and when even when you're offline, uh, map SMS forms. Uh, MMS, uh, which is multimedia messaging, um, all on this map, and then basically sync to the web when you can. Um, so the last two, two little bits of technology, um, we're looking at basically ways to shift the burden of structuring this information away from end users and towards more central points. So we worked with a computational linguist based out of Stanford um, to essentially make sense of large amounts of unstructured data. So he took six months' worth of Jichewa text messages from a clinic in Malawi um, and applied machine learning uh, and different layers of artificial intelligence to essentially use subword natural language processing to auto-categorize these messages, um, which was about 96% as accurate 
uh, as humans doing it. So we're really excited about this and think that this could um, help with triage at a clinic, but also uh, with gauging disease burden at a national level. And David alluded to this, but I think we're going to see a real breakthrough in MMS-based diagnostics uh, in the next 6 to 12 months. So we're working right now with Adigan Ojan's group based out of UCLA, and what they've essentially figured out how to do is to hack a $15 camera phone add-on to do intracellular imaging. So you slide a blood sample into the back of this device, you shine an LED on that sample, uh, and you catch a holographic image uh, on the CCD chip. Then transmit that image by MMS, and what will sit within the software uh, at the central server is actually a pretty simple algorithm that compares the incoming image to a cell library and will shoot back a diagnosis by SMS. Uh, and so low-hanging fruit is malaria, um, certain uh, STDs, complete blood cell counts, with potential for HIV, uh, TB tests, as well as CD4. Um, so I think this could, this could really be a breakthrough. And all of these tools, um, all these systems, come back to our, our mission statement uh, to create connected and coordinated health systems that save more lives. Um, and I'd be happy, and I'm looking forward to diving into discussions um, that center on maternal health, because I really do think that there's low-hanging impact uh, to be had there. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. That's a lot of food for thought there. And um, uh, I just want to emphasize as well, we are counting on a pretty robust discussion after our presentation, so um, keep your questions in mind, and, and we will, go, we will in, get them going. Alan Labrique is from Johns Hopkins University, an assistant professor, another bio that I will not try to read. Um, uh, Alan is going to give us a, more, a, the, a, a really interesting academic perspective, I think, now that we've, um, we've, been, we've had the sort of the overview of the, of the convening mechanism and then the practical application on the ground, and um, we thought Alan's presentation would help us uh, frame this and, and ground this. So over Thanks, to you, Alan. Tim. And good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon, despite the tornado watches and brave weather out there, um, to participate in this discussion on how existing technologies and innovative approaches can potentially help us to improve health where it's needed the most. Today, I hope to explore some of the landscape of maternal and neonatal health priorities sharing some relevant data for Bangladesh, where our group has been working now for over a decade. And throughout, we'll hopefully see some examples of opportunities and challenges for mHealth in this and similar contexts in resource-limited settings. As we know, the burden of both maternal and neonatal mortality are co-located on two continents, with a proportionately higher concentration on the Indian subcontinent. A significant challenge to reduce these rates in the immediate future is getting the necessary care on time targeted to where these deaths are taking place. This is true for maternal and neonatal mortality, where the first days and even week remain a period of extreme vulnerability. Across most of South Asia, most deliveries still occur in the home. In our research sites, over 80% of the deliveries that we've seen in the past 10 years have taken place in the home with little to no trained attendants. However, these crisis events do not occur in a vacuum, and there are strong known associations between uh, elevated mortality and maternal characteristics, such as age, parity, nutritional status, etc. Here's some data from a large population cohort we've been working with since 2001, looking at data representing 12,000 live births. Overall neonatal mortality in this group was 57 per thousand live births. But you can see a clear association with uh, poor outcomes with younger maternal age, as an example. Furthermore, each of these tragic events, we often see reduced to a group statistic, reflects a complex series of circumstances that have led to that death. So here's an analysis of 250 deaths of women of reproductive age. These are women between the ages of 14 and 45 in rural Bangladesh and whose deaths were attributed through a verbal autopsy process to chronic conditions. Now, we see how decisions influenced either by a lack of resources, that's to say poverty, or a lack of information have lead, led to highly convoluted patterns of care seeking, 
beginning for the most part with traditional healthcare providers as the first line of treatment for most women, and then moving to provider to provider looking for a solution. Now, I want to share with you a typical narrative account of how delayed decision making compounded by delayed transport can have tragic consequences. Here's the account of a 20 year old woman who experienced obstructed labor. When I tried to give birth, the umbilical cord came out first. The dye, or traditional birth attendant, who was helping me called two other trained dyes. They were afraid to touch me because they said they had never seen anything like this before. Two hours later, my family called an ambulance, but the baby was already dead, probably from the cord being wrapped around its neck for a long time. This narrative from a verbal autopsy reads, during the home delivery, the child's head became stuck. An untrained dye used her fingers to pull the child's head to deliver the baby. The placenta would not come out even after much pulling. The woman had so much bleeding that it flowed over the floor. The family hurriedly took her to the government hospital where attendants inserted their hands to remove the placenta. The bleeding stopped. The woman became very weak, but doctors were unable to get saline to enter her body. They suggested the woman be transferred to the district hospital, but before the family could arrange transportation, she died. So we talk about shifting the paradigm of care towards a continuum where each life stage has an impact on the next. These create different paradigms of opportunity to improve maternal and infant health outcomes. From early interventions, focusing on improving knowledge, delaying marriage and thus pregnancy, to more immediate interventions ranging from the delivery of antenatal care, immediate emergency obstetric and neonatal care, and to ensure rates of high vaccination coverage and IMCI, the appropriate delivery of IMCI. But M Health does not have to be complex. The opportunities for mobile phones to act synergistically with existing health system, as Josh so clearly showed, in low to middle income countries are many. In addition to improving access to information and routine preventive care, one of the most critical ways in which phones are being used, even in the absence of formal M Health systems, is to compress the time between the crisis and care. So to compress the time between crisis and care. So if we revisit this timeline of pregnancy, from the identification of pregnancy to the delivery and immediate postpartum period, there are numerous ways in which M Health strategies can open up opportunities for intervention. First, if we look at the windows of opportunity, here are a few ones that traditionally intensive community health worker programs have been needed to identify, register, and counsel pregnant women. As Tim pointed out earlier, the simple act of documenting pregnancies and outcomes in these communities is among the most important obstacles we face in understanding the magnitude of the problems and in calculating program impact. Next, we have windows of extreme vulnerability. Periods in this pregnancy continuum where risks are high and without immediate appropriate responses where the crises are occurring, it's difficult to expect to save lives. The M Health innovations, of which these are a sampling, offer the, a potentially wide range of solutions that could provide the health systems and its workers access to these critical windows of opportunity during pregnancy. So in today's talk, I'll be drawing on data generated from one of our flagship research sites in South Asia, the Javita Population Research Site in Northwest Rural Bangladesh, shown here in red. This area represents a typical agrarian population of the Gangetic floodplain of South Asia. Covering a size of over four times Washington, D.C., we set up this site in 2001 working with the Bangladesh Government Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, supported by USAID and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. A staff of 850, comprised mainly of community health volunteers, conducts pregnancy and birth surveillance, enrolling on average 300 new pregnancies every week. Three large randomized control trials to explore specific interventions to reduce neonatal and maternal mortality have been conducted in this site. Enrolling to date, almost 100,000 pregnancies from whom we have learned. 
Enrolled mothers are periodically interviewed for diet, morbidity, and other interesting facets of uh, their health and their infant's health. Pregnancies are monitored weekly, and vital events reporting is ongoing using both paper and digital systems. Field-based study workers on bicycles reach newborns within 18 hours after birth on average. So this system generates volumes of data on each woman's pregnancy, reproductive history, health, and infant outcomes. This area is now among the most exquisitely mapped of South Asia, allowing us not only to enroll and track research participants over time, but to also use innovative evaluation techniques, such as distance to facility, healthcare provider catchment area, and treatment seeking behaviors to evaluate interventions. So let's look briefly at some of the findings from this population. We see early marriage is still extremely common and that women become pregnant soon after marriage. If we think that girls are getting married at, on average at age 16 and a half, half of them within 13 months are pregnant. So these are young women becoming pregnant while they themselves are still growing. Infants are born small and vulnerable to a wide range of exposures. Our median birth weight in this population was less than 2,500 grams. Many of these babies are born before they're ready for the challenging environment that awaits them outside the womb. And a health system that despite much progress in recent decades continues to struggle to deliver standard preventive care to the majority of its rural population. This first red bar, I'll point out, means zero antenatal visits. At 76% of this population. So what have we seen with mobile phones? Well, like we've seen elsewhere in South Asia and Africa, as David pointed out earlier, penetration of cell phones is high, as seen in the cell tower location map at the right. And even in this resource-poor rural community, ownership of phones has been steadily increasing. However, it's important to note that this does not necessarily mean that pregnant women have phones, nor, as others have shown, shown, access to the phones, given to the strong male-dominated culture in many of these South Asian populations. Now, even more interesting is some preliminary data that suggests even in the absence of a formal mHealth system, cell phones serve as a critical link in times of crisis. We did an interim analysis of almost 12,000 pregnancies recently in the past three years, looking at near-miss events. So near-miss events are, are near-death experiences in, uh, in women's uh, uh, reproductive history. And 5% of, of women in this 12,000 pregnancy cohort experienced what they judged to be a near-miss event. Half of these women reported using a mobile phone during that crisis for a range of activities, ranging from calling a provider to their home to asking for financial aid to assist with the care. Here are some examples which demonstrate ways in which mobile served as critical links to, again, compress that time between the crisis and care. A 23-year-old woman who experienced obstructed labor says, when the traditional birth attendants realized they could not handle the delivery, they phoned the family welfare assistant for advice. She told us to go straight to the government hospital where I received an emergency C-section that saved me. Another narrative from a 17-year-old woman who experienced PPH says that after delivery, I lost so much blood that the village doctor could not make it stop. He used his mobile phone to call an ambulance to immediately take me to the maternal and child welfare center. So again, anecdotal evidence, but still interesting examples. But one of the major challenges in resource-limited settings is what I would call the equity gap between the population that bears the highest levels of morbidity and mortality and the population that has access to mobile phones and can afford the downstream services. Here we see how, as I showed you a few slides ago, there's a clear temporal trend of increasing phone ownership in rural families. However, there remains an important gap in ownership of phones in any given year between high SES, shown in green, and low SES, shown in red. And this gap persists very clearly over time. 
Now, why is this important? Because as epidemiologists, we always have to consider confounding. When we see a success story about cell phones and health, we have to ask ourselves, are there other factors that are involved in that association that we're seeing? So looking at neonatal mortality in the same population over the past six years, we see, thankfully, declining trends in neonatal mortality in both the high SES and low SES subgroups. This time the green, high SES, are on the bottom as they experience overall lower neonatal mortality, but a similar gap exists over time, persisting, stressing the importance here of addressing equity and access to phones when evaluating the impact or success of mHealth interventions. Now we also examined whether the speed of birth notification, in this study site we've set up a a very extensive birth notification system because it's important for us to get to the births soon after they occur to, to collect uh, data on that uh, delivery. And we examined whether the speed of birth notif notification differed by whether the family owned a mobile phone, here shown in blue, versus not owning a mobile phone, here shown in red. And we found that over the most recent study period since 2007, um, Ownership of a phone in the family did not change the distribution of time to birth notification. So the, the distribution of these two histograms is almost identical. And this suggests either A, that traditional notification systems work well, or perhaps that household phone ownership is not necessary for rapid access to phones in the community. So where does this leave us? Well, as you've probably heard epidemiologists say before, we need more data. <laughs> and we don't have the answers for what works with mHealth at the moment. But we can focus on quantitative demonstrations of impact of mHealth technologies that will play a critical role in mobilizing resources to affect program and policy level changes to influence stakeholders, and we can focus on delivering evidence-based MNCH interventions through the vehicle of mobile technologies while we work on developing um, new opportunities that mobile phones give us access to, which we didn't have access to before. To move forward, we need to work on developing a common mHealth vocabulary. We need a common set of a clear set of research priorities and definitions of success, definitions of success that are driven by data. And we have to agree on ways to prioritize our efforts and spur the donor community to support these prioritized efforts. Now, in public health, we like to put things into diagrams. And, and here's a, a nice three-dimensional perspective on finding the target space for each setting in which we think of an mHealth application, it's important to understand the context on a number of axes, X, Y, Z, and even axes that I haven't been able to display on this, on this graph, um, to see whether the mHealth intervention will be a good fit for that population that we're targeting. And you know, the continuum is not only the continuum of pregnancy, but the continuum of technology, a continuum of financial capacity, and a continuum of coverage within that uh, population. There's also existing health system infrastructure, burden of disease, mortality, et cetera, that have to be considered. So in conclusion, ICT and mHealth solutions have tremendous promise to improve maternal and infant health in resource-limited settings. However, it's important to not let the technology drive the public health agenda. The priorities for maternal and child health are clear. What's needed is an understanding of how these tools can most effectively strengthen or enhance health systems in settings that need immediate stopgap or long-term infrastructural solutions uh, to prevent maternal and neonatal deaths. Thank you. Come back to the table. Thank you, Alan. <clears throat> Again, great, great food for thought from a different vantage point. Um, I'd like to open it up to the floor uh, to questions now. We have a, a friend from Woodrow Wilson with a microphone here 
who is going to ask, uh, who's going to pass it around. And I think we, you know, just one, as you guys are getting your questions together, one thought that, Lee, uh, uh, that Alan left me with is that, as again, and when we're talking about uh, uh, new opportunities in, in any public health intervention, the technology is not the silver bullet. It's, it's, uh, it's the application of it, it's the user interface, it's the sustainability of it. And I think we have a lot of um, provocative uh, ideas on the table to explore today. Questions? Great, right there in the middle. Could I ask you to use the mic? Thanks. John Titigas with uh, Deloitte. Um, curious, have you had any direct applications for SMS in the, uh, in the education space or learning space for help? Um, so that's, so mobile learning is new, I think, and um, sort of pointed analyses of those interventions are new. I think there are lots of people are, who are getting excited about it. I would point you to James Buntempo, who's at Japigo, um, and they're running a program out of shops in Uganda looking at just that, um, at actually building Frontline SMS Learn, building mobile learning modules on top of the Frontline SMS platform. Um, so I'd be happy to put you in touch with him that's just starting up now. Yeah. Can I just add one another Please do. Uh, at, at Hopkins, there's also a group uh, which has developed the eMOCA yeah. teaching and learning uh, strategies, um, which, is, which is actually being used in, in a lot of uh, sub-Saharan Africa to provide training to community health workers. Um, and that's available on, online as well. It's not frontline SMS, but it's a different uh, platform based on an Android uh, operating system. I, I got to ask you to use the mic because we're being um, <laughs> uh, videotaped and televised and broadcast. So okay. Now I don't know if I can ask, ask the question. <laughs> so, so it uses a number of different strategies, including messages, but also uh, interactive um, training videos and that sort of thing. So it's a very versatile platform. Okay, but specific to Android? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Question in the back there. Thank you. Emily Moore, Independent Consultants. I think I'm the only gray-haired person in the audience here. No, no, no. Not quite. No, I promise you, what hair I have left is gray. <laughs> <laughs> Many years ago, one of my colleagues uh, said to me, Emily, you are a techno-peasant. And I said, I know you're trying to insult me, but you have just succeeded in insulting the peasants who do understand much of the environment in which they have to operate, whereas I do not. I wonder if any of you would care to comment on how do you teach people who have not seen mobile phones before and all of the, the complications that go with it. How do you teach them and what barriers do you encounter in training them how to use them? Hey, 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 oh, wait hey, down hey. to that level, please. David? Hey, I think one of the things we need to recognize is that they're way ahead of us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right. the, the, the cell phones are out there getting used um, by billions of people uh, in pretty sophisticated ways, uh, and it's the public health community that has been left behind, the medical community that's been left behind. The, that doesn't mean that everybody's literate in, in how to use a phone, but people who are using phones are literate in how to use phones, and people and they are texting. Uh, so so the, the first thing to recognize is that it's already happened. The question is, can we take advantage of it? Um, when, when I go along, drive along the highway in Limpopo province in, in northern South Africa, and there's no electricity towers anywhere near, and there are kids walking along the street doing exactly what they're doing here, thumbs going like crazy, um, and using smartphones, not you know, new ones. Uh, how they got them, I don't know, but uh, we're ahead of that. Now, that is not to say that the human side of this is not critical. I mean, I think the training capability side of this for the health community is really a much bigger issue than technology people tend to say, well, here's software. You know, 20 years ago, it's like, you're a teacher, here's a computer, put it in your classroom, you know, things will get better. And, and that was a big mistake. So, yeah, we need to focus on people, but, but I think the, the, uh, the, the literacy issue is more in our communities than it is uh, on the ground. Yeah, so when we land in country and do these trainings, the community health workers that we interact with don't 
look at us strangely. Um, you know, what are the what are these mobile phones? What are you here to do? The the question to us is what took what took you so long, in a sense. Um, you know, they're already using these phones to run their businesses, to coordinate with their um, to coordinate funerals. You're shaking your head, but I mean, so so. Then, well, the, inter the other interesting piece of this. You said you, you said you were driving along. That's a paved road. Yeah. So in, in 2008. It's not a village road. In 2008, I'd say about half of the community health workers that we were implementing with owned a mobile phone already. We were distributing to 100% of people in our programs. Um, and the other half um, had every incentive to, to learn as fast as they could and teamed up with community health workers uh, to learn how to text. If you look at a coverage map of South Africa, the entire country, with the exception of the Kalahari Desert, and if you're in the middle of the Kalahari Desert, it's not my problem, uh, is, co is covered by 3G signals. Um, and those were not put there because the cell phone companies want to bring service to rural Africa as a, as a service. It's, it's there because they're making money off of it. Uh, that's what's remarkable about this. This is not the discussion that I participated in 30 years in this country of how do we get service to rural America? Well, let's subsidize it. This has happened through the private sector. And so I don't want to minimize the, the point that there are people who are illiterate and for whom we can use simple things in the technology like voice to text and text to voice, um, uh, w ways to get around uh, uh, barriers that some people have. But the primary resistance to use of technology I have found in this country and abroad is from the medical profession. Uh, let's uh, go in the back here next. Thank you. I'm Dunya Luwale from Africa's Health in 2010 at AED. Uh, you talked about bridging the gender equity, and that's what I'd like to address. When the um, insecticide-treated nets were first being distributed, we were at exactly the same point of big gender inequity. But just a month ago, there was a publication that said, indeed, the distribution of nets is now bridging the inequity in gender. And I just want to tap into your knowledge and experience on how we can fast track the process of bridging this gender inequity for improved maternal and newborn health using cell phones. Right. Alan, you want to take that? Sure. Thanks for your question. Um, I'd say it's an excellent point, and, and I think there's been a, a number of people who have raised this concern. Um, there are two dimensions of priority. One is the acute saving lives that are being lost right now, and the other is the strengthening of the health systems on, uh, on the much lo longer scale of time. Um, I think when there is a perception that the cell phone or the systems that are attached to the cell phone or the, the care that's provided through the cell phone have significant value to the family, to the pregnant woman, to the breastfeeding new mother, then I think there will be a much stronger impetus to to uh, empower the woman to have a phone, to have access to the phone. Right now, the cost is a very limiting factor because a family can afford maybe one phone. Um, if there's a phone in the community, then it's a shared resource. And, and so strategies that offer targeted counseling, targeted messaging to a particular person uh, need to be thought through that type of a model where the distributed network of information. So. Uh, I think creating demand, creating perception of value will be important pieces of that strategy. Let me agree with that. Um, Ten days ago over at the State Department, we, uh, there was a major event uh, around a program called M Women. Uh, Hillary Clinton kicked it off with Milan Verveer, and, and uh, essentially what it is is the wireless industry, global wireless industry, saying there's a big problem here. There's a gap between men and women, and from their perspective, it's a big business problem. They want 
to get women subscribership up. Uh, there are 300 million less women using phones. In Latin America, it's 50-50. Mm -hmm. In South Asia, it's 38% less women using, or using cell phones than men. And so I think the answer is exactly this. And what we've been saying to the wireless industry is work with us on maternal health so that the value proposition of having a phone goes way up. And that's to your business interests. It's going to help save lives. You'll look good, but, but you know, you're going to make money too. So. Yeah, I think there are two questions of access there. The first is um, access to benefits of the technology, and the second is access to the technology itself. And a lot of what I'm hearing with M Women and others is how do you bridge you know, from 300 million, that gap, take it to 150 million. My question is can we get a, a million community health workers empowered with these tools to give access to the benefits of these technologies to the other 299 million? Yeah, that's a critical point because what we're developing is an argument to the wireless industry as to why they should give free smartphones to community health workers. Um, if you think about this, this is an industry that, that, that succeeded based on the uh, give away the razor and sell the razor blades idea. Um, and they want people to use more sophisticated phones. Um, so they want to drive people up the smartphone pathway. Uh, what better way than to empower a community health worker with a smartphone so that people can see, oh, you can do that with a phone? You know, this, this is cool. And those are very interesting conversations that are going on because I think that's the key intervention. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, how to empower that person in the community. Well, please follow up. Um, recently, the First Lady of Rwanda distributed one million mm -hmm. cell phones to women in the country. You know, I just saw a big window of opportunity to get those women to begin to use it to inform one another and talk about maternal health, talk about, you know, critical challenges that they face in access to care in you know, raising resources, pulling resources at community level to be able to access care, and talking about danger signs in pregnancy. Did you register for antenatal care? Who is your caregiver? You know, it, it's this kind of networking that we really need to promote, but they can do that because they have the tool in their hands. So we need more people to go out there and just make this available to them. The SMS cards are very cheap. Many of them can afford it. I made a comment about the absence of political, senior level political leadership in, in pushing this forward as the number one problem. The outstanding exception, the one outstanding exception to that rule in the world is Rwanda, Rwanda. where the president, the minister of health, the president's wife, and a series of other people really get this. Okay, let's take a series here, right here, and then Madeline, and then Marge. independent consultant. Uh, for the community health workers that are literate and uh, have had some schooling, the text messaging may work. Uh, what do you find works best for those? Because in many countries, uh, when you're working with research projects, you usually have these workers who have some degree of education. But when you're working with programs, you very often have those that are really not that literate. Uh, are you using things like uh, voice to text messaging or uh, have you found the use of pictorial tools? Uh, are they useful in this uh, <coughs> a small image area? Uh, do they function uh, reasonably well or do you have to make adaptations? Yeah, so, so should you direct that to Josh? Okay, so why don't Josh try that yes. <laughs> so, so first, yes. Um, voice to text, text to voice is tremendous. Um, makes a lot of sense. <laughs> The other thing that we've done is gotten creative with pictures and not pictures on the handset because a lot of times we're using lower end phones, at yeah, least to date, well, um, but actually pictures on a piece of paper so that this image of a person coughing and that symptom is matched to a number, which is essentially a symbol um, that, they, that they punch in, or using preset SMS so that all you're really doing in the first two hour training is navigating a phone menu, and that's what you need to be able to do. Um, and uh, again, there, there are communities of support. Um, you know, they turn to their children, their fellow community health workers to get this done because it's important to them. If I can just up, I think give a segue to that. It, it comes back to, to sorry, your question earlier in the back uh, about the, the technological gap between 
what we perceive to be uh, community health workers in extremely rural populations who have been isolated from this global revolution that's taken place. In 2001, when we set up this particular trial site, communications were so bad, we were contemplating training carrier pigeons. Six years later, 850 staff on their own, and these, these are community health volunteers who live in non-main road communities, uh, in, in mud huts, now own their own cell phones and they've learned to operate them and they communicate with one another. You, and, and we've seen changes in the way they micromanage their, their own field areas using phones, even before we suggested management strategies using phones. Um, as, as David brought up, this issue of power. How, how does one power or recharge a phone where there's no solar panel or a power outlet? in the middle of, of Noldanga of Gaibanda district. Uh, they've come up with strategies where when the husband goes to the market to buy fish and, and vegetables, he takes the cell phone battery, drops it off at a lo local shop and gets a substitute battery. And like we change gas cylinders here in the US, they change cell phone batteries. So, so they've, systems have come up to, to accommodate and to, uh, to support these new technologies in, in extremely rural populations. I just want to come back. David, you, you had a slide about the number of cell phones that, are, that exist in the developing world. And that number, since I've been looking into this when I was in HIV several years ago, that number just continues to escalate beyond measure. It's not even sure we can get accurate measurements. So people are getting them and using them. As, mm. But mind the gap. It's but mind the gap, right. It's a really important point because as health people, we need to focus on how to take advantage of kind of the center of this. Uh, there will always be fringe areas where we don't have coverage or people don't have a phone. But if we build to the past, we'll miss what the great Gretzky said, which is don't skate to where the puck is, skate to where the puck's going to be. And, and what's happening there is an ability to put real information power in the hands of people in a community. And we ought to take advantage of that to the extent that we can. A hockey metaphor in maternal health. That's what I like. Madeline and then Marge. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I always find outrage drives me. And, and yeah. I got outraged when I read in The Lancet how many kids in sub-Saharan Africa are dying or freezing to death. And how a baby can freeze to death in sub-Saharan Africa is like beyond me. And, uh, and yet they do. And they do because blood doesn't heat the body when, in a preemie. And so when you wash the kid and you hold it up in the air, they freeze to death. This is a checklist issue. This is not a high-tech issue. And there's this very low-tech solution called kangaroo care. You take the baby, you put it right in the breast of the mother, you wrap it, you put the, the uh, and it turns out skin to skin is passing antibodies. It's not just the mother's milk. So they're really simple, basic, informational solutions to these things. And, but they're not being communicated. And we're not, and, and as Atul Guan says, if we need, let's just get checklists in this world and we can save a lot of lives. <laughs> Madeline. Yeah. Hi, I'm Madeline Tasquier from case. Women Deliver. Um, Alan, you sort of answered my question. First of all, thank you all for a wonderful presentation. Um, talking about powering the cell phones. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of challenges, I mean, the challenges are very obvious within rural settings, but what kind of specific challenges are you seeing with the new technologies and the different, you know, powering cell phone or smartphones and where do you see power going? How are we going to generate power to power these cell phones and bring them to these communities? There's a wonderful solution that is coming out of the bottom line self-interest of the wireless industry. And it's just, just a wonderful story, I'll tell it quickly. The biggest single operating expense of the wireless industry in uh, Africa is diesel fuel. Um, and so sitting on top of one of those companies, you're saying, I want to cut this cost. This is not making me any money. It's not because they want to be green. It's just it's costing them a lot of money. They also, a lot of them are from Scandinavia, so they want to be green too. And so, so, they're, so they're looking at ways to uh, use renewable resources to power those. Point two, what they've discovered uh, is that their engineers knew this all along, is they're producing 30% more power at every one of these rural sites 
than they need for reasons I cannot explain to you anymore, and I can explain that, that uh, thing that Adegan is doing uh, with, with his uh, 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 microscopy. But it's a fact. So the wireless industry realized that they're producing 30% more power. Then they realized that, that there's this whole business grown up where people are taking their cell phone batteries into town and paying, on average, 30% of the wireless bill in Africa is going for charging. They're not getting any of that money. It's going to somebody for charging. So the combination, Ericsson is leading this. They have a solution, which is that they're going to create community power. They're going to give away that extra power uh, that hopefully will come from renewables so that you can charge your phone in the village and therefore use more minutes that they'll get some money out of. Yep. I'm really excited about that. I think solar is going to keep getting better and better. We use $7 individual panels that we can share between three and four community health workers currently. Um, and that's cost effective, I think. Uh, the other thing I'm really excited to see uh, is the pairing of bicycle power and mobile phone charging. I think it's coming really soon. Global Cycle Solutions out of Tanzania. This is very bottom up. It makes sense to people. We're going to see that hit scale, I think, in the next two years. Marge, did you have a question? There's, there's quite a few micro-scale power generation solutions that are being developed that are you know, in the next few years, including microsolar, microturbine, microwind, um, at the at the point of use level. So, hi, Marge Kaplinski with John Snow and MCHIP. Um, extremely interesting and also of some concern, especially in Asia, where private sector is taking over in terms of deliveries for women. So a lot of the uh, increase in use of facilities that we see over the past 10 years is now in the private sector facilities. And with that increase in the private sector for birthing, also you see an increase in C-sections and so forth. I could see some kind of challenges, some other perverseness happening when you bring in e-technologies and so forth. And how do you, in terms of them being able to buy um, the goods and give them out to community health workers. What, what is happening is that they're giving referral fees to community health workers and the newly trained midwives to bring um, candidates into, their, into the private sector. And if you could set this up through an e-system, it would be very even more imp uh, exciting for them, I'm sure. So what I'm concerned about is the challenges of how do you ensure that uh, the perverseness that we now see in the maternal health field um, doesn't get extended. This is a technology. really, really fundamental point. Um, and and I, I try to separate two things. If you are out there providing maternal care or any other kind of public care and you are not using modern information systems, you're doing a disservice to the people you serve. You're wasting our donations. Uh, you, know, you have to use modern technology to do what you're doing efficiently. You just got to. Second, how that information get used is neutral. Policy is not connected to efficiency. It's a critical issue, but for example, you know, if we can bring payments into the M Health system so that the two work together, then we can pay community health workers on time. That's a great thing. But if we can transfer money with a wireless phone, we can also do lots of negative things like the things you're talking about. Um, so the, the cell phone, or, or better said, modern information and communications technologies, is simply a neutral efficiency thing, access to information. Doesn't mean the information's good doesn't mean the person getting it is going to do the right thing with it. Um, it just means that you have the possibility of doing these things more efficiently. So, so I, I think it's very important. I mean, people say, oh, my God, you could violate privacy. Yeah, sure, you could violate privacy. But you also can use modern information technology to protect privacy a lot better than open files sitting out in the middle of a, of a doctor's office. So these are all really important policy issues. But I think they need to be looked at independent of the technology, and it is not, we cannot take the position that we're going to defend people from <clears throat> private sector abuses by not using modern information technology. I mean, that's just not a credible position. Josh or Alan, can you jump in here at all about the, the, the concern that Marge is expressing in terms of private sector exploitation potential? Yeah, sure. So 
as a nonprofit mobile health organization, we can choose who we work with. And right now we're being pulled in a million different directions, but pu being pulled in those directions um, by, by impact and low hanging fruit to have that impact. And so you know, we work with private sector, we work with public sector, we work with NGOs, um, but we're, get, we're designing these systems to create impact. And I think his point is, is really well taken that um, you know, mobile technology is, is gonna be used for lots of different things. It's a platform. We're essentially creating, uh, so, so paper is a platform, right? And you have you know, different sizes of paper that can be used for different things, and you can teach people how to write on that paper and use it in health systems, um, sort of similar to how we're designing systems on a new platform with new technology. Um, that just happens to be more efficient. And so at these early stages, you know, we're, we're, we're being involved um, to, to design systems that deliver impact. Let, let, let me give you another example when I'm personally really worried about and really looking for guidance from you and, and your community on. Ultrasound is a phenomenal um, device to save lives. Remote ultrasound at a price point below $1,000 per unit it can revolutionize how we do diagnostic care. It can, it, in my hand, so I can diagnose where I, there, I have internal bleeding by sending a signal someplace where somebody who knows what they're doing can look at it. So that's really exciting. It can show me whether the cord is wrapped around the baby's neck. There's lots of really positive things that I can imagine with a really cheap ultrasound. On the other hand, we know that ultrasound clinics in the developing world are being used to figure out whether you got a baby or a, a baby boy or baby girl so you have an abortion of the girl and you could imagine what that tool could be be used for in the wrong hand so you know there's a real case example of something where where we don't need the private sector involved to get abuse that we've really got to think through how we're going to because if the i don't think the answer can be well let's not have inexpensive ultrasound technology um, and i don't think that's a good answer but but there's a real problem here okay let's move on here uh, oh actually i just wanted to add something to marge's uh, okay. question um it brings us back to the definition of of success and when we talk about, when, when we listen to anecdotes or reports of success, whether we're talking about bed nets or whether we're talking about mobile health, it's important for us to consider the neutrality of that success and the, the evidence, the, the quality of the evidence behind that report. Um, in, in some areas, there, there is a strong buy-in off the private sector. As, as David pointed out, they've been driving this m mobile phone revolution. However, when you start coming into the domain of, of mobile health, where governments start to be involved, the public sector gets involved, there has to be some clear lines of, of responsibility, of uh, regulation for data availability, and uh, how that information gets used. I think, I think there are, it's a hot topic in, in thinking through the, the regulatory mechanisms for this information. Uh, one of the, the things that I put up at the very end was uh, talking about patient confidentiality. Having all this information available for pregnant women, for their newborns, the same basic principles of research ethics or of human subject ethics that exist here in the US apply to a pregnant woman, whether she's living in Namibia or in Bangladesh. Um, there, there's, we have seen too many, too many uh, historical issues where information in the wrong hands has led to very, very uh, tragic consequences. So it's important for us to think through these issues and start putting in place protections and mechanisms that, that uh, will, will at least guide us on the right path down, down the road. We, so I don't think it's a threat. I think it's a great opportunity. There are four countries in the developing world that have real laws on this kind of data use, electronic data use, much less mobile. So like, there's not, nothing there. And then you have a country like ours where we have all kinds of laws, but I don't control my personal medical data. I can't download my data and control it and say you get to see it and you get to see it and you don't. There's an opportunity here to really have personalized medical information and say the policy is that you own the data about your body. 
and your family and your kids and to say here's here's the best here's the best practice law that, that that's been worked out by by folks let's pass this law and as, as we wrap this one up i just want to ask david is, is or, or uh, any of you is there a forum where the maternal health experts like marge kablinski can participate in bringing to light these issues about patient confidentiality, about potential exploitation by the private sector, that, and what is, is that for? Is there a bigger softball you'd like to throw me? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, I mean, that's exactly what our uh, maternal M health initiative is designed to do. Gee, and and so. we're, we're really trying to create an environment where people can come together and work on those things and where we don't purport to be the experts on those, but, but with the hub tool and, and bringing people together, we think we ought to have those conversations quickly before we have to take on the entire insurance industry and you know bankers and everybody else the way we have to do in this country to get it right. We're big on convening at the Maternal Health Task Force, so I respect that. Yes, finally, I'm getting to you in the back there. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Nadi Nina Koonga, and I'm with the Earth Institute at Columbia University, and I'm also a student at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And um, my question is, and I think we touched upon it a bit with the um, chargers or you know powering the phones, but what other measures of sustainability are being taken in the mHealth space? Especially, like, we have a lot of these projects and interventions that are taking place. What happens when, you know, the funding for those projects ends or they pull out? How are we empowering the communities to continue on with that? How do yeah. individuals sustain their own plans, their own cell phone plans is an issue. Josh, do you want to start with that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, hmm. I think one of the best measures is whether or not people continue to use your tools. And they will if it impacts their lives positively, and they won't if it doesn't. And um, I think that's, that's one of our major measures. And it's, it's sometimes as simple as that. Not always. In Ghana, uh, the Gates Foundation has funded the Grameen Foundation to work with Columbia Mailman and uh, some other folks in, in the Ghana Medical School to put together a program called MoTeC, uh, which is one of the first um, pieces different components put together to provide some level of service along the continuum of care. Um, they showed that to uh, the United Nations Foundation Board um, three days ago. And so you, here's, you got Ted Turner sitting in Accra with a nurse showing him this M Health stuff, which is, he thought was pretty cool. And his first question is, how much does it cost annually? And how are you going to sustain this when Gates isn't writing the check? And they said, one, they don't know. They, 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 Right now, it's 12 bucks a year per woman for this for this whole kind of throughout the continuum of care, uh, and so where does that 12 dollars come from? And when I said we haven't figured out the the health value chain or the business that model, that that's exactly what I'm talking about. Because if you take that chain, you could go to the wireless carry and say, hey, it's in your interest to get more female subscribers for you to contribute a piece of this, for you to host, you know, part of it or make some contribution. They're not going to do the whole 12 bucks. So. Uh, it's, that's a conversation we got to have. I don't think anybody has the answers to that right now. On the other hand, if you look at what it takes to deliver that care under the WHO model of this many doctors for this many women and this many clinics, there's no money, f there's, not to begin, there's money, but not enough to do that. So whatever this is we think is cheaper, we don't know how much cheaper, and we don't know where this money's coming from yet. That's it. In the back. My name is William Esiet. I work in Lagos, Nigeria. As I sit here and I'm listening, I feel a sense of optimism. But how do I translate this? For maternal mortality and uh, neonatal mortality, we need to, talking as a Nigerian, we need to be able to say this is the magic tool. Is this technology? what we are looking for, knowing that the greatest causes of maternal mortality is postpartum hemorrhage, unmet needs for family planning, and unsafe abortion. So how do I sell this to the Minister of Health in Nigeria to say this is what we need to invest in? If it is not the magic tool, what percentage of women dying in rural village in Nigeria will this affect? 
if I know how many women are pregnant in my area, um, and I know who they are and I know where they are, I have an ability to track whether they've got the pill or not. I'm also told that there's a combination vaccine that, it, that if injected within a, a very specific time after birth, uh, cuts parent-to-child transmission of AIDS to, uh, down to a very small percentage. Yeah. So, my God, you want to talk about cost effectiveness. You want to keep somebody on antivirals the rest of their life or give them one shot, we have an ability to track where they got it. The UN Foundation gives out bed nets. I mean, that's a huge thing. We have nothing but nets. You want to track whether somebody got a bed net or not. So is the solution the cell phone? No, the solution is the pill, the shot, and the, and the net. But the cell phone system allows us to track whether they have them or not, and I'm the minister. I can say, have we got it? Why is this place 30% underperforming that place? Alan wants to follow up here. And, and I think the, po the point that Josh made is, is, is very important. It, it comes back to this issue of, of developing a common M Health vocabulary. Um, when someone asks me, does M Health work or is M Health successful? It, it gives me pause and time to step back and say, well, what do you mean by M Health? You know, we, we have an agreed upon definition of what, what M Health means, but in the context of a particular country, of a particular part of a country, it's a, it's a package that is delivered via the vehicle of M Health that I think needs to be carefully defined. And that what that package will be for South Africa may have common elements with a package for rural South India, but there will definitely be different components of, those, of that M Health package. And, and evaluating those packages is a, is a different uh, ball of wax. Just to tie our policy dialogues together, we recently did a dialogue here at the Wilson Center on transportation referral. And one of the people in that, in that conversation was saying that they feel that the ambulance company in, in, uh, in India, which is very successful, was saying that their ambulances are look, being looked at as the silver bullet. But it's not the silver bullet because the ambulances don't work without the cell phones. And the ambulances and the cell phones don't work, out, work, work with good, without good roads and good cell connections. So there, that, the, one of the upshots of that, of that uh, policy dialogue uh, event was looking at intrasectoral cooperation within governments around this issue of referral. So we are looking at the Maternal Health Task Force, looking at putting this dialogue uh, on, on M-Health uh, into our general lens around referral so that uh, we don't look at this as one, again, one silver bullet, because it just doesn't exist in maternal health. Yes, in the back again. Hello? No, that's good. Just a short historical question. It was only two years ago when I was working in Sierra Leone for a few months that I happened to be sharing uh, hotel accommodations with a couple of cell phone. I don't know if they were... Um, salesmen or technicians or what, but they were there. One of them was British and the other was uh, British Jamaican who could speak with the local people in Creole. Uh, and their interest was using cell phones for agriculture, which I, well, I was already familiar with that. I'm, my historical question is, why did the health sector take so long? And is there anything that the health sector can learn from the agriculture people who were saying, hey, this is good for finding out what the market prices yeah. are? Yeah, I'm not sure it has to take as long as you may think, but David, want to take that? Well, I don't know, because I kept asking myself that question when I, when I was focused on the U.S. This is, why, why do American health care people and emergency people think that, that they're divorced from the rest of the entire economy? I mean, everybody else does this. Walmart does it, and you know, uh, Starbucks, you know, you call the pizza place. They say, do you want the usual, Mr. Elward, you know? And, and the pizza place knows more about me than, than the doctor does when I walk in. To, um, There's a divine irony there, there you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so I, I don't know. I, I think there's an important truth underlying what you're saying is that if you go and you look at this the right way, which is focus on the woman, she doesn't create these silos. She's a woman. She's there in a village, and she's got different needs. One of them is agriculture. Uh, they do a lot of the farming, and one is would be payments if she could do that and and talking to her friends or communicating with her friends another one and and you know healthcare 
And so if we look at these as a package, as a value package, um, and, and not let these, but that's hard for us because you know we're health or we're HIV AIDS or we're Gates funded or you know we're all in these different silos. So I think the best way to break out of it is to always ask ourselves who we're working for and keep focusing on the, the fact that, that what this is really about in my mind is empowering women. And a lot of really good things flow from that, and that's a scientific fact. I understand there are a lot of studies about that. At least that's what women in my life have told me. So. And, and just to note, HIV prevention uh, counseling <coughs> has been using cell phone technologies for, for as long as cell phones have been around. So that's, uh, it's been throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. It was showcased at, the, at a 2002 AIDS conference that I was at. So it's been around. I mean, one of the dangers is that, um, I mean, you, you talked about history. What happened in the United States when computers started coming in in healthcare is that smart people came out of medical school and said, well, how come we're not using computers here? And so the x-ray folks got their own computer system and then somebody else came out of uh, a hospital administration and school and said, how come we're not using a computer here on, on admission? So they put in a computer system. Da, da 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 and we ended up in hospitals with eight or nine different computer systems that didn't communicate within the hospital, much less with any other hospital. And now we have Washington Hospital Center that has the most sophisticated uh, electronic system possible within the electronic health system. God help you if you try to get those records over at Sibley. So um, you know that's exactly what we need to avoid because you know we can throw 19 billion dollars at that problem, and we just did. Um, uh, these countries can't afford to do that. So we need to get this right. And if we don't move quickly, uh, that's where we're going with this. Any other responses? Josh? Alan? Okay. Questions? Yes? Thank you for your presentations. I'm Shefa Sichter. I'm a doctoral student at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. I was wondering about uh, donor priorities. You you all mentioned that health information systems, um, health management of information systems has been a donor priority um, recently. Where do you think the M Health priorities will be for donors um, now and, and in the future? It's a very I think good donors question. are way behind the curve. I think most of the donor groups are kind of like the, the heads of government. They're um, they don't understand this. They weren't part of it. Um, uh, and, and so getting the, it, but in the last year, we've seen a lot of coming together by the, by pieces of the donor community, trying to get a common front on this to common standards, common architecture, kind of a technical, uh, coming together. Um, but up until now, what we've seen is just the opposite, is I'll fund that innovation and you fund that innovation, I'll fund another innovation, so you have all these little pilots getting funded, none of which work together. Uh, so uh, we're right on the cusp of whether the donors get their act together. The leading group on this, by the way, right now, trying to pull people together, are Canadians and the Norwegians. No surprise. Josh, what are you sensing from your on-the-ground perspective about donor trends? Yeah, so um, foundations and donors in the U.S. we've found um, are supporting staff and supporting people to sort of spearhead these innovations. And what we're finding is that the people who are then funded by these foundations, um, the lead developers at uh, nonprofit and for-profit tech startups and groups, they're starting to talk to each other. I mean, they, we're all friends. We all know each other. We know what we're building, um, and it's going to interoperate. Uh, just, I'm actually pretty confident about that. Um, but I think the more interesting question is what's happening uh, from in terms of donors that are that are scaling these programs, um, USAID contracts and subcontracts and that sort of thing. And a lot of what we're doing these days is trying to figure out how um, technology and mobile technology in particular can essentially extend and amplify what groups on the ground are already doing. And I think that's what USAID and others want from these tools. Um, they want more impact, faster more efficiently and with better data. But just an extension of that, I, I'm struck by what a comment David made earlier in your presentation that I see the words ICT don't exist in the Global Health Initiative. And uh, uh, pardon me, I'm, I'm the I'm a neophyte from New York when it comes to how USAID works with State Department policy. I'm not sure that does it. 
Uh, oh, so, yeah. No, no. So the PHI was put together by state and AID and CDC. It was all working together. It was a I White House-run initiative, and they put it all together. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I've got friends from abroad who call me and say, I thought this was the BlackBerry president. What happened? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's – Global Fund is giving away – gazillions of dollars and do you see any requirement there that they use efficient information systems no um, well bank gives money away uh, is there a requirement they use efficient no um, but it, it's also to what is that attributed panel I think let's give your perspectives I mean Alan? you're also looking at it from from two different approaches one is a, is a grassroots empowering women on the ground to have control over their reproductive lives. The other is a institutional empowerment approach, which is health system strengthening, um, which, which by its own definition has to come through government existing health systems and, and work within those parameters. So not that the two approaches are incompatible, but the donor streams and the strategies are, are fairly, fairly different. Um, when you look at the typical trajectory of evidence to policy that we've seen in the past you know, century of, of public health, uh, things that are now global policy, such as, such as vitamin A given to kids between the ages of, of one and five, the, the trajectory from evidence to policy took almost two decades. We knew this saved infant lives across South Asia, but before it was standard policy across the countries where the burden of disease and, and mortality was the greatest took about 20 years. So, so these, as, as you know, David brought up the good point of uh, outrage driving us, and, and to many of us, we, we, we constantly deal with a daily dose of outrage. And, and uh, you know, part of the struggle in public health is to, again, compress that uh, time between evidence and policy or great ideas at the grassroots level translating into a health system strengthening. I guess I'm not as worried that ICT and mobile don't make it, that, that, that language doesn't make it into GHI. I think that these tools shouldn't be funded unless it's furthering um, your mission and it's furthering the work you're setting out to do. If you want X number of women to enter antenatal care, but X plus 100 are going to enter uh, within a month because you're using mobile tools, that project sh should be funded. The second one should be funded mm -hmm. and be funded because it's furthering the work uh, that you're proposing to do. So I'm not as worried. Maybe it's naive. Maybe it's naive. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it is because, with due respect, because one of the things we've learned is that these things don't happen voluntarily. Um, the, the private sector part happens voluntarily, and it happens really fast. Um, and they're on six-month cycles of change, uh, which is one of the problems because you, you've got a, a public health community and a medical community that's used to really slow cycles, and, and kind of bringing those worlds together is hard. But um, in order to enable the, the explosion of innovation and empowerment at the edge, which is what we want to do, there are things that have to happen in the middle. We only had this global explosion because there's a thing called the Global Standard for Mobility Air Interface Standard, GSM. We, people are making Nokia phones for the world. They're not making a different one for Kenya than they are for Tanzania. And that's why, and there are a few manufacturers building the standards. That's why we have a global wireless revolution. And we've got to do the similar thing in global health or we're not going to be able to have this explosion of write it differently this way in Bangladesh to make it work there and differently in Tanzania. That, that core set of technologies has got to be standardized and that requires government. Private sector will not do that on their own. And just to follow up, the, you mentioned the Global Fund doesn't have this, but the Global Fund is run by country coordinating mechanisms. Those proposals come from the countries themselves. So it's not the Global Fund in Geneva that's saying we won't, um, uh, we won't uh, put ICT into our funding parameters. It's, the, it's not coming, if it's not being funded in the, through the Global Fund mechanisms, and it's not coming through the CCMs. Oh, absolutely. I said to Pepfar, how can you do something common and share it? 
They, we can't do that. We have different pro country proposals all coming in, and they're all going to have M Health in them. I said, terrific. We're going to have 30 different versions of M Health all getting funded out of garages, and you know that that is not advancing the cause. <laughs> I sense that I we feel are strongly about it. I sense that on a strong and passionate <laughs> note, we may be we may be winding up our, our our discussion today. And I just want to give each one of our our, our presenters or panelists an opportunity to to sort of sum up their um, their their thoughts today after their presentations and hearing your colleagues and hearing your questions in the discussion. And I'll start with Alan, if I may. So I think this has been a, a very very interesting discussion. We've m m many of us have been talking for for quite some time, and the potentials for mobile phones, and I'm going to say this again because it's really the, the key message here, to enable us to do what we know works, to deliver solutions for which there is evidence, there, there are many of those opportunities. And we need to explore how this tool can be used to compress, to accelerate, to, uh, to monitor the delivery of evidence-based interventions. At the same time, we need to think outside the box. There are windows of opportunity that we previously did not have access to. Preterm deliveries don't need to be waited on to know that they are high risk. If we can have rapid birth notification when a, or, or labor notification using cellular phones, the healthcare system can reach out and proactively be at the place where the crisis is most likely to occur, which in most of South Asia is in the home, in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa is in the home. So, so there, are there are new opportunities and there are existing evidence-based opportunities that we have to act. And I think for, uh, for either way, there are different strategies. I think we also have to put out a call for generating that evidence because for anyone who's worked in the, the policy arena, you know that policy is like a, a giant elephant. To move policy, to change policy, you have to convince governments, you have to convince multilaterals, you have to convince donor agencies that this is a worthwhile investment of limited resources. Thanks. Thanks, Al. David? So, we met in um, um, New York last month um, about achieving the Millennium Development Goals, and a global strategy was announced, and, and we're honored to be working with, with that team led by the Norwegians in trying to achieve that. Uh, they have decided that, that innovation has got to be a piece of that, and the lead innovation is the one we've been talking about today. Um, we don't begin to have the answers there. Uh, we do begin to have a sense um, of what's possible if we all come together and work on that. And so um, we, we know that the, um, there are people of goodwill and enormous experience all over the world who, um, if given help, can do, uh, given assistance, given some tools they didn't have access to, can, can do a, a much better job uh, on, on this critical set of issues. So. Uh, we're a new group. We're delighted to work with folks. We have some resources. Uh, we have an event next week, uh, 10 days from now. We'd love to have you involved in. I, I mentioned the event. Um, so we invite you to help lead us uh, and help help us help you. Uh, there are two people I wanted to introduce you to, Kat Mern uh, and Sarah Strubel. Uh, our, Kat's helping lead our maternal initiative, and Sarah's helping her. So. Uh, if you want to get anything done with us, they're the people to actually know. But thank you for your time. And Josh, yeah, word from the coder. So I'm I'm admittedly a, a, a softy with techie friends. I don't I don't code. Oh, okay, okay. I'd good. like to learn. Um, so I'm trying to gauge sort of who we have in this room based off of the questions. And I think my ask to all of you um, is to help us identify you know, the needs and the gaps in these health systems and. The, big, the biggest disconnect that I'm seeing right now is the speed at which policy um, and these sorts of discussions move, panels, the whole nine yards, and the needs on the ground. Um, what we're hearing from community health workers, from clinicians, from even program, program managers. Um, and so what, what we are focused on is crushing the barrier to entry for these tools. And I, I, I have a lot of faith in the MHealth Alliance and other groups um, the open source community at large uh, to figure out policy bits um, to lead discussions around open standards. But what we're, we are really focused on 
um, is, is lowering barriers to entries for the tool, tools themselves. Um, and the last thing I'd, I'd say is I'd really encourage us to shift, um, shift our focus from data um, to information, to knowledge, to action. And this, I think, comes back to the sustain sustainability question and how we frame these programs for the end users. Um, is the question, you know, we really would, would love for you to submit data. Um, can you do that? Or, you know, we really want information. Or we really need to know. Or we really need to act. And I think that that last framing is what's going to have these problems implemented, sorry, these, these tools implemented and problems tackled at scale um, and sustained long term as well. Great. Thank you, all three. Before we uh, bid adieu, I just want to uh, plug our next policy dialogue, which will be November 30th. Uh, the Maternal Health Task Force and UNFPA, represented by my friend and colleague Sarah Craven, sitting in the middle. Say hey, Sarah. Um, uh, along with the, with the Woodrow Wilson Institute, we're, we're going to be convening our next dialogue, and the topic will be maternal health commodities, another hot-burning issue in, uh, in the maternal health movement. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Woodrow Wilson, our National Center, for hosting this, and thank you for attending. <laughs> <laughs>